Hi, friends. I hope you're having a lovely day today. Uh, today, I'm having another conversation with somebody I've been wanting to also have a conversation with for a while now. Uh, and I think this is going to be a recurring theme because I, I, I think what I do is I see their work, I make a video about them, and then I spend all my time trying to then have a conversation with them. <laughs> and then it finally happens. So today I'm here with uh, Michael Duke, who is somebody who is a fantastic street photographer. He has very unique uh, photos and he also is a very kind human being because he sent me a box of his prints, which I've yet to put up on my wall, but I want to. Say hello, Michael Duke. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to reach out to me. I really appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Thank you for being here. We've been, uh, we've been doing a little bit of um, back and forth. Uh, ch what's it called? Where you, uh, let's see. Uh, t oh, phone tag. There we go. We're trying to uh, coordinate this this conversation here, but today we are here and we made it happen because persistence and love wins or something like that. So, <laughs> Michael, I, I would like to ask you, how long have you been doing photography, period, but uh, and then lead into how that evolution went into street photography? Great. So uh, let's see. I have worked as a journalist for the last, I guess, dozen years, and we're a small publication. So I write the news stories, I clean the toilets sometimes, and occasionally I had to learn to carry a camera. So I guess my journey maybe would have started about six years ago, but I was more of a guy with a camera uh, and not really a photographer. Um, but things kind of changed about two years ago um, where I decided to really focus some energy and attention on it. I was definitely bitten by the photography bug. I mean, my grandfather, who had been the publisher of our newspaper, you know, certainly loved photography. My dad did as well, my brother-in-law. So it was kind of already in the DNA, I think. Um, but I, don't, I wasn't ready for it yet. But two years ago, I got bit really hard, and it's been something that I've spent probably way too much time doing for the last two years now. Awesome. I love it. Uh, so how did, how did that transition into street photography? Because I, I find that the general route to go for a photographer is I, I have a macro lens, and I take photos of flowers, or I want to take up wedding photography. <laughs> why, why, <laughs> why, why walking up to strangers on the street and taking their photo? So I guess when I uh, decided to, to get better at, at shooting pictures for the newspaper, um, I checked out this wonderful institution in Houston. It's called the Houston Center for Photography. And I ended up taking just some basic classes there, two or three classes. And I'll give a shout out to, to this amazing instructor. His name is Lynn Lane. And one of the classes I had taken was street photography because, you know, reportage news kind of happens and you don't have a lot of control over what's happening. You just kind of have to capture the scene. And I figured that street photography was kind of a similar, similar situation. And, uh, the class did not go well. Uh, Lynn told me that I should never try street photography again. Oh, wow. And of course, okay. That's a when good somebody, <laughs> yeah, but when somebody tells you, you, uh, stink at something, uh, you want to go out and prove them wrong. So yeah, maybe that was his plan all along, right? Perhaps, yeah. He uh, he definitely knows how to tear you down before he builds you back up. And I had since taken a couple of classes with him too, and he's just amazing. And I uh, I just I love the streets. You know, I I was actually born in Tehran, Iran, um, but grew up in Houston after my family was evacuated during the uh, Islamic Revolution there, and pretty much have lived in Texas my whole life. And you know, there's some great street photography done in New York, in California, Chicago, Paris. I mean, go down the list, but Houston never made that list. So, I don't know. I thought it was fun to uh, just start hitting the streets and telling the story of Houston, Texas, because it's a pretty dynamic society. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. It's one of the most ethnically and nationally diverse uh, communities. So, uh, it's been a lot of fun getting out there and, and basically just meeting people. Gotcha. Cool, man. Uh, is there something about people that really draws you to this? I think so. It, perhaps, you know, the street photography is an extension of me just being a journalist. Um, you know, I have to, to learn how to talk to people. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in other people. Um, I think in terms of subject matter, I tend to be attracted to folks who have the appearance of having a very different experience than my own. 
Like I'm a pretty straight laced, clean cut guy. Um, but you know, beautiful hair. I see. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're fellow redheads here. Uh, <laughs> But you know, we uh, when when I see when I see some guy walking down the street covered in tattoos, dressed fairly differently than I am, uh, I don't know. That's the guy I want to go talk to because we have a different experience on the surface. But usually, what ends up happening is I find that you know we end up having a lot more in common than we don't have in common, mm. and so you know, kind of these pictures are born out of, I guess, my desire to try to find some relatability and points of connection with other people who, you know, share the same city that I do. So what, what, what kind of photography really inspires you? Uh, so, you know, in the last two years, besides getting out there, uh, and making my own photos, I've certainly tried to do some education, some self-education, uh, Bruce Davidson, his work is just phenomenal. Um, you know, he did reportage, photography covering the civil rights movement with the freedom writers but also did these amazing projects with you know brooklyn gangs and uh the was it east 100th street in new york and the uh, subway gang series um really really intense stuff um i like mary ellen mark a lot you know she went in these uh i guess for lack of a better description insane asylums as they would have been described at the time and photographed women uh, who were essentially locked up. Um, and then she went to Seattle at the time when I think Seattle was kind of named as the base, the best city in the United States. And so she kind of went looking for the worm inside the apple uh, and encountered a group of kids who were living on the streets, you know, making their money in a dangerous way. Uh, and she just made these really amazing, compelling photo essays based on those stories. So I, li I like storytellers. Um, and that's kind of what I strive to do, um, you know, in my own work. Hmm. I, what, what do you, what do you think it is that street, street photographers seem to have this sort of common bond of, of editorialism and wanting to, to, to go to the disaffected people and the people that, that you, if you saw, you know, you're walking down the street and you saw them, you'd, you, you would be scared that they might stab you and take your children uh, or your cats in your place. <laughs> um, uh, what, what is it about street photographers that, that how, how we're different than that, how we're drawn to that? Okay, you know, I can only speak for myself, but, you know, I want there to be empathy for people and the circumstances that they find in their own lives. You know, I think a lot of folks face similar challenges. Uh, things get in the way of us understanding that, though, and I think that's why we have conflict. But at the end of the day, I think people, again, are much more alike than they are uh unalike, I guess, if that's the right description. Um, you know, in terms of the downtrodden, you know, so I, I grew up in a Jewish household and I continue to identify that way. And, you know, the Jewish people have had their challenges certainly mm -hmm. over the years. Um, you know, you see the inequality and the racism that exists, you know, in American society today, particularly during this recent election cycle. And that resonates with me. I think the, the black American experience right now parallels the Jewish experience, you know, in previous decades. And mm -hmm. so Interesting. I think, yeah, again, I, again, I, and I look for these points of connection. And so I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why I'm drawn to shooting, you know, African Americans, the Latino experience. Also, this is an immigrant society um, that has had trouble with integration because of, uh, you know, our our problems in this country. And again, you know, Jews had a tough time also immigrating initially to the United States. And so, you know, I, I just think there's an inherent uh, similarity there. So I think that's why personally I'm drawn to those types of stories and wanting to tell those, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's so important, why, wh whichever direction you go with these current issues, it's so important to remember that because we're in a certain, <laughs> we're in a certain bubble of, things where, where things are not horrible right now doesn't mean that history doesn't repeat itself and we're not that far from you know the 40s or the 60s or the 1800s or you know this we're, we're we're not fundamentally changed as people right we still have the tendency to do pretty horrible things uh, i totally agree and you know in these catastrophic catastrophic events that we've faced um you know they don't happen overnight they it's a progression right and these little things build and 
you got to be aware and you got to be calling attention to those little things so that we can prevent, you know, future problems from happening. So I think, I think there's an element in street photography to kind of advocate for social justice because you uh, can call attention to some of these problems um, and, you know, raise, raise public awareness about them. Mm. So, uh, so speaking of social injustice, what gear do you use? (laughs) (laughs) What gear? Like (laughs) photography gear? Oh man. So, uh, on social media, I use the uh, the handle Fuji Fojo, so that would be like Fuji film cameras and then Fojo photojournalism. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so when I started shooting for the newspaper, I was on the Nikon system. You know, I learn I learn more about uh, usernames on these on these uh, videos than I learn about anything else. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's how we like to identify ourselves. You know, uh, yeah. but and and listen, I think gear can build community, and so like. When I switched, when I started trying street photography in a serious way, you know, I switched to the Fuji X system, and there's a serious community that's been built around these cameras, and I absolutely love them to death. You know, I'll, I will say though, I think that the gear does not make the photographer a good photographer. Can go out and make a great no. photo, whatever else, but. Um, the, the best cameras are those that get out of your way as a photographer and just ah. do the job that you needed to do. And the Fuji cameras for me do the job. They're small. They're exceptionally well built. The Houston weather sucks. We are very hot, humid, and rainy. So these things have to have good weather sealing. Um, I shoot with prime lenses only, and these are all super fast lenses. And it's just, they're, it's a killer camera. I've taken them all over the world now. And uh, they just keep going and going. And the great thing about them, too, is they're not terribly inexpensive. But the nice thing about Fuji is that when they come out, they come out with these firmware updates and they're free and they happen periodically every few months. And it's like getting a brand new camera for free um, because they'll fix autofocus and add additional features, too. So you don't have to go out and buy a new camera body all over again. So. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm very evangelical in my Fuji. I'll talk about it all day long, but I'm sure I'll be boring people to death over it. So, <laughs> no, I, I, that's all. I think Fuji cameras are are gorgeous cameras. <laughs> they are I, I, just in terms of uh, aesthetically. I mean, th- all these other cameras are are starting to get more. You're 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 they're going through the period of I think that cars went through from like the 80s to now, where they're <laughs> all just plastic and round and awful looking. I, it's nice to have a you know like I, I love yeah. the the X Pro and the um, the the rest of them crap I forget the other yeah ones, so ones yeah these ones. are these are made out of metal and they have right angles to them and they have dials you know more dials are more fun as far as I'm concerned yeah. and I, I like the rangefinder layout so I do have an XT one I have an XT two that I rented for a recent wedding that I had to shoot but my go to camera every day is an X Pro two so I love it love it love it. Well, so what would you say to somebody who's starting out and they're like, I need a camera. I need a DS. I watched QVC and they said that I need a, you know, I need a Rebel T8i <laughs> and this kit lens because it makes my photography better. What would you tell them? I would tell them if you live in a city that has a real camera store, go to the store, check out the used shelf and take your time, bring your laptop, bring your own memory card put that card into 10 different cameras, play around in the store, uh, talk to the experts there and see what feels good in your hand. You know, everybody's got different, uh, different needs in terms of what they want to shoot. Uh, the ergonomics will feel differently. I, I, I can never buy a camera online. I've got to have that thing in my hand to really know it's going to be a good fit. So that sure. would be my advice. Buy used and uh, buy in person from a local brick and mortar shop if you can. Oh, I like it. I like it. You know, I, I find that camera stores need to step up their game in customer service, though, because I find most of them are, are antisocial, like, <laughs> not very interactive human beings. I, I, I hope that yours are different. Well, you know, I, I think photographers tend to be solitary creatures. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have friends who are photographers, and I have friends who want to go out and shoot together. And when, that, when they arm wrestle me into doing that, uh, they end up shooting all the pictures. I end up shooting nothing because I have to work alone. And so photographers, if they want to pay their bills, end up, you know, working at camera shops sometimes. <laughs> and, right. uh, but they don't learn, they don't lose those personality traits. Uh, however, there's always exceptions to the rule. And 
you know, here in Houston, we've got Houston Camera Exchange. There's an awesome lady named Mary there who could care less if you really buy anything from her. She's just there to share the love and to share uh, her expertise. I'll look and, for Mary uh, if I ever come to Houston. Oh, yeah, yeah. Def definitely check out Mary. She's been around a long time. She's amazing. Cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, shifting back to the more important stuff, uh, walk us through a normal photo walk. What, what, what does that process look like for you? All right, so... Um, do you do any, like, meditations and yoga in the park before you... <laughs> or... I, I wish I was that that cool, but I'm really not. I, <laughs> um, I wake up at, like, 3... So I shoot a different environment. So if I'm at home and I'm going to go shoot street, I uh, will check out when the sunrise is going to come up that next morning. I like to shoot in the morning. It's a period of transition. You kind of catch the people who have had a very long night, um, and then you catch the people who are getting ready to have a very long day. Mm. Um, and so I find out when the sun is going to rise and I try to get, I try to get to that location a good half hour beforehand, uh, to kind of catch those people in transition and transit. And so, you know, I'm out there at 5 AM. I'm out there even sometimes earlier. Uh, there's a, a stretch of downtown Houston, um, it's kind of the historic part of the town where on one end is Buffalo Bayou and then about a mile down is another, <clears throat> another, I guess, peer, point in the city where like the skyscrapers kind of, uh, disappear and it goes to back to shorter, shorter buildings. So I'll walk that one mile stretch each way. Um, and on the Buffalo Bayou end is kind of interesting because that's where all the local county jails are. Uh, and so you have a, a very interesting crowd kind of congregating around that area. And then on the other end, you've got business people and they kind of all come together and, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a shooting gallery. Um, I think part of the challenge in Houston is that we love our highways and our pickup trucks and everybody, and there's free parking in most of the city. And so people drive here. It's usually, you know, 90 plus degrees as well. So just out of comfort, we like to drive. But uh, when we hosted the Super Bowl for the first time um, a while back, they decided to put a light rail system down Main Street, and now we're getting ready to host the Super Bowl again, and that project is pretty much almost finished now. And so for the first time, we have some foot traffic uh, in downtown again, and so that's kind of where I like to, to hunt for folks. Um, and again, there are people from all walks of life in Houston that are down there. So uh, it's a lot of fun. I like the morning crowd, though. I, I, I like I like to work in the morning. <laughs> awesome. I, I think that's so intriguing because there's I, I think there's this thought process in photography for a lot of people that it's it's not something that you would get up early for. It's not something that you would hustle for. And I find that the photographers that really create compelling art are the the ones that have some sort of work ethic behind what they're doing and. They're 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 not going out at uh, 12 p.m., which I I will sadly do sometimes, but um, <laughs> more more so than I, I would like to. But I, I think that's fantastic. I think that that's uh, that's super inspiring. I'm, I'm so glad you said said that you get up in the morning and go out and look oh, at yeah, the, sure. the good light. You know what I mean? And, and logistically too. My my wife, my wonderful wife Rachel, likes to kind of sleep in on the weekends, especially so uh, it doesn't cut into uh, husband and wife time. If I'm, you know, done and dusted for shooting oh, by 10 a.m. and I'm already good. back home, yeah. so yep, you gotta pro you gotta have your priorities right. You don't want to so. mess that up. Mm, absolutely not. She's whole, already uh, patient enough. <laughs> <laughs> whole world falls apart when that doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, so, what what do you think it is about your uh, your personality that lends to street photography? What 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 are your strengths in that arena? You seem like mm -hmm. an incredibly engaging guy. Oh, uh, well, thanks. I, I don't see myself. It's funny, you know, I'm kind of an introvert. Um, Me too. And yet I've chosen a career, journalism, uh, that forces me to interact with people. I also am a part-time teacher, which forces me to interact with people. And then I shoot street photography in a way that I interact with people. I know there's street photographers who do it purely as observational, but, you know, that's not my style. I want to get in close, so... And I want there to be a, a connection between viewer and subject matter and myself. So, um, 
I don't know. You know, my grandfather was a people person. My whole family, they're they're pretty, I guess, social and outgoing. Uh, and so it kind of allows me to have a, another identity, I guess. Um, you know, I stink at social media. Uh, I don't return phone calls and text messages, yeah. as you can attest, uh, on, on a in a good way. So my, my friends are few and far between because they, uh, you know, lose patience, but, um, hey, no, I, well, the good thing is I'm the same way. So I have, <laughs> I have immense patience. This <laughs> nice. could have went on for three months and I would have been like, Hey, no, next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So yeah, it kind of allows me to be a different person in some ways. Um, which is nice probably because it helps me, I guess, develop more healthy habits in terms of being social. Sure. Sure. Well, so uh, there are some introverts that I think are the the true the truest. Like I want to get in a corner and I never want to public speak, and I I am okay with you know talking to one person a month. And then there are the ones that I think maybe you fall into the same category as me, where we like we we really enjoy the alone time and we gain our energy from that alone time. But at the same time, we're very we're, we're very interested. We're very ambitious about challenging ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to, I want to grow as a person for sure. And so pushing yourself outside the comfort zone, I think is a huge step toward that goal. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll get really personal here too and share some personal information because it's something that I've done some, some reporting on recently. And that is, um, uh, people who suffer from depression, uh, clinical depression, you know, and, and I'm yeah. certainly, I'm in that group and photography has really been, for lack of a better description, a coping mechanism for me because when I'm feeling really bad and I can't push myself out of bed to make a work appointment, somehow it helps me muster enough energy to go out and shoot for the day and that helps me bounce back for the rest of everything else I need to do in life too. So it's been kind of a wonderful thing for me. Uh, in terms of being able to kind of live with this, you know, mental illness. So yeah, well, it's, and um, I, I find that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I find that in depression, a huge, huge thing that is incredibly important in somebody's life is momentum. Is generally hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yep. And so yeah, it's one it's one foot in front of the next. And so whatever gets you to take that first step, it really uh, it helps you put the wind to your back. Without yeah. a doubt, so well, and, and nothing, nothing does that better than walking up to a scary person on the street. I think, I think walk, I think somebody walking up with a camera is much scarier than like somebody you know covered in tattoos and having a scowl on their face. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I, if somebody approached me like for a conversation and wanted to make a picture with me. Like I would totally run the other direction. So, <laughs> uh, so you're your own worst mi- nightmare. Yeah, I think I'm the scariest guy in the street, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, when when you're interacting with people, what's what's the process look like? I mean, uh, it seems like your photos tend to feel fairly candid. So, are they? Uh, you say you like to interact with people, though. What's that balance? What's that dynamic? So, yeah, I I always have the antenna up. Uh, you know, when I used to pretend to be a street photographer, I'd walk around with my earbuds in and like completely be divorced from really the environment. Mm-hmm. So one of the very first things I decided to do was leave the phone in the car. Um, and so just having your eyes and ears open helped me basically my senses are, are, are going off. And so I'm looking and listening for interesting people around me. Uh, when I notice somebody You know, I kind of evaluate the scene that they're in to make sure there's a story there. And in my approach, again, having a small camera that I'm really comfortable with, and I'll be really geeky and and admit that I sit there and I practice in my mirror shooting from the hip. So I don't usually use my viewfinder, actually, because I know with this, I shoot with one focal length. It's a 35 millimeter equivalent. I know what my camera sees without having to look through it. So I will make some some images in my approach to the person, uh, and obviously, if they don't notice me, I can make more images. But I'm six foot tall. I've got red hair. I'm not that invisible, so people tend to eventually notice me. And so I'll chat them up, you know, let them know that I'm here making some street photos. I always start with a compliment. You know, you can't go wrong with that. Um, 
and we'll talk for a while and I'll say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm shooting this scene here. Do you mind if you end up being in some of these pictures? And we're like, oh, no, that's totally fine. So uh, if they give me the okay, we'll talk for a little while longer if they're going to stick around. And then when they kind of forget about me, then I'll go back to making a few more photos. Um, if they're in transit, though, and they're on the trot, so to speak, uh, I may not have all that time. So I just try to shoot away. And I've learned that it's usually better to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. Um, and so, yeah, I think in Houston, though, people are pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I know there's photographers who use, you know, big flash guns and are kind of in your face, and that's totally not who I am, you know. Hop out from behind bushes and stuff. Yeah, that's not me. You know, I, people shoot with longer lenses and whatever else, and... You know, I shoot with a, a, a wide-angle lens, and I, I've got to get in there close. Uh, I want to see the color of people's eyes and that sort of thing. I mean, I think that's kind of what my photography is about, uh, at least the successful images are. So, um, you know, people have personal space, and you got to kind of figure out where that personal space is. Um, but, you know, again, be nice to somebody. That personal space usually can be shared. And I think, you know, good street photography allows that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so do you deal with, and I want, I want your answer to tailor to somebody who, who is really trying to, to start their, their journey into street photography and they're struggling with kind of the challenge and the fear of it. And I think for some people it ranges from, uh, like I, I'm like this guy might give me a weird look, and that's kind of like fight or flight response, scary anxiety, lizard brain type stuff. And then, <laughs> and then there's like debilitating fear of interacting with this person. Where do you, where do you tend to fall on that spectrum? And what would you say to people who are who are kind of dealing with that, like myself? So, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I would say be lazy. So, <laughs> and what I mean by that is if oh, like talking to, if talking to people is really hard for you. So find a way to make photos where you don't have to talk to people. Mm. Um, for me, talking to people, I guess, comes naturally, you know, despite being an introvert or whatever. It's, it's never been a speed bump for me. It's, that has never slowed me down. Getting a good composition or good exposure, that has slowed me down. So I've had to kind of work at that. But um, I would say find where you are comfortable and use that as your entry point um and get good at other things and the more you're out there i think the more comfortable you'll be in attempting to do things new you know in my in my case i like going back to the same location over and over and over again like that one mile stretch in downtown houston from buffalo bio to dallas street i go back and back and back over and over again because I have to think about less. Like, I know what the lighting looks like. I know what the architecture in the streets look like. So I don't have to figure out any of that compositional or exposure stuff anymore. I can then focus on the more dynamic elements that I have less control over, and that is the people. So if I were to give advice, I would say go and work the angles that you are comfortable with now get good at those and then use that as encouragement to try something new and more challenging, you know, eventually you'll get there mm -hmm. as long as you're, I don't know, stubborn and not willing to, uh, I guess, rest on your laurels, you know? Gotcha. So, so you don't, you don't really struggle with, uh, with anxiety of walking up to people. No, I, for whatever reason I don't. Um, uh, yeah, so it's hard for me to relate to to somebody who does have that problem. Um, That's a blessing, but <laughs> I guess so. I mean, yeah. it's a curse too. I mean, listen, you approach the wrong people, uh, you get in trouble. And I think Houston's a fairly safe city, but you know, I like going to rough parts of town and dealing with supposedly rough people. I mean, and I've had guns pulled on me before. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. um, I've had police freak out at me uh, shooting over at the jail and capturing things that perhaps they didn't want people taking photos of. So you got to be on your on your guard for those sorts of things, and you have to be smart. But I think if you're too cautious, then you're cheating yourself because when you are too cautious, you're going to miss some really great photos. And yeah. sometimes you got to stick your neck out there, you know. Um, I was in Poland this past summer 
and there I was in Krakow, and I heard the like screech of a tire, and so I ran to the corner, and this woman who had been walking her dog, the dog got hit by a car, um, and she kind of scooped this poor little dog up, and as it was kind of dying in her arms, she was running back and forth on that block and she passed me a couple times i speak no polish she didn't speak much english and i don't even know if it would have mattered because she was in such shock i tried to help a couple times she passed me back and forth and you know i had the camera there i wasn't even thinking about making a photo but then kind of not knowing what else to do i told myself you know if she passes me one more time i'm gonna be that total jerk and i'm gonna try to make a photo shot it from the hip. I think I made one or two exposures and it ended up being a pretty good photo. Um, that was way outside my own comfort zone. Obviously I felt like a terrible human being for even trying to do it. But looking back at the image now, it's one of my better images, I think from this past year. So I was, I was going to ask you about this photo. I, th I think it's an incredibly brilliant photo. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right, That's the one I spoke about in the video, right? Yeah, I think you did kindly mention that one. Yeah. So it was a tough one. It, morally and ethically, it was a really tough one um, because I still think about whether or not that was the right thing to do in that situation. So you just kind of have to roll with that. You know, I guess coming from maybe a news background, I think I can't remember the photographer who decided to you know, shoot pictures when Reagan got, oops, sorry, that was the cat. Um, <laughs> shoot, <laughs> shoot pictures. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching, uh, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but I'm watching uh, him on the Skype call right now. And I see a, a, a black cat walk across yeah. in front of his face. Very... Yeah, he's, he's quick. He's stealthy. He could be a very good street photographer. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was impressive. <laughs> yeah so coming from a news background you like have to make decisions okay do i try to help somebody and intervene in a scene or do i sit there as a professional and record whatever is happening and so maybe maybe that helps influence me a little bit you know mm. but and i think too in terms of getting over your fear with like your earlier question treat this as a profession you know treat it as a job and like I think you'll be willing. You'll be more willing to do something if your job depended on it than it were if it were meaningless, you know, and just a hobby. And I don't treat my street photography as a hobby. Uh, I treat it sometimes more seriously than the writing that I have to do. Um, and so maybe that would help push people to the next step too. Yeah, well, I, I agree. Anytime I've ever I've ever been in a situation where I have a camera in my hand and I'm doing it for some sort of a job I have to actually deliver for somebody or yeah. I'm getting paid or whatever, you go into a different headspace and you get, a, you get over a lot of those humps pretty quick. No doubt, for yeah. sure, because uh, you have to have something at the end of the day. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's like figuring out how to, it, it's this uh, art of figuring out how to put yourself into that headspace on a daily basis or something that will make you just, you know, really really push past the daily insecurities of, and weirdnesses that happen in your brain totally and you know and just kind of thinking in my own experience one of the things that i did to kind of get me into the game so to speak was to buy a, a, a pretty decent photo printer like you asked me about gear earlier uh, i have a canon pixma pro 10 which is kind of like the mid-range uh, but it's got, I think, 10 different ink cartridges, maybe eight. Printing pictures has really helped me be serious about this because, you know, in the digital world, the images kind of float in, float out, and it's not really real. It's not an artifact. It's not physical. But having the opportunity to print your work um, makes it real and makes you want to <laughs> pick a better image because the thing you just printed ain't going to cut it. So... <laughs> You want to go out next time and work twice as hard to make sure it is worth, uh, you know, the money that it costs to have ink and paper. So, anyway, I would definitely advise people to to take the time to go get a great little printer like that. So, oh, I, I, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Good thoughts. Um, so, what do you hope? What do you hope to achieve with your photos? What What do you hope that when somebody sees it on the other end, what What's the impact? What do you want to happen there? Wow. So I guess it depends on the project. Um, and I'm a project shooter. 
if there was one thing that kind of connects all the projects, though, I guess it's an element of, of empathy and maybe social justice. Like, I want to raise awareness about, I guess, just other people's living situations, their circumstances, the challenges they face, the lives they live. Um, I think if we have better understanding of other people, I think society is just better. Um, we are invested in each other's lives. We're more connected. And the more connected we are, the more opportunities we'll have to go forward together. Um, because when we're not connected, then some people get to go forward and others get stuck behind. And, you know, we have the in a, inequality and that's not a good thing in my opinion. So, um, yeah, empathy is really big. It's up on the list for sure. Um, you know, sometimes it's just to raise awareness too about specific issues. I mentioned earlier that I shoot around these jails in downtown Houston. And so I've done some projects, um, where I try to tell people stories who are kind of coming out of jail and the challenges that they face and their families too, because it's not just people who are being, you know, incarcerated, but the families kind of go through their own level of imprisonment as well. Um, and so I try to bring a little attention to that. I like shooting in laundry mats also. I <laughs> uh-huh. see. I was about to mention that as well. You're yeah. 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 <laughs> so I actually I got married about a year and a half ago and we moved back into the neighborhood in which I grew up and it's a cool part of Houston it's southwest Houston where you've got you know kind of a mixture of middle class folks and people who are trying to make a better life for themselves there's a huge Chinese and Vietnamese community moving in there's your Latinos and I was trying to look for a microcosm where people are trying to, I guess, capture that American dream and make a little bit better life for themselves. And so looking for the setting to tell that story, I stumbled into this laundromat where you have working class people who, you know, are in these apartments, living in these apartments that don't have machines. Um, but hopefully with a lot of hard work and nose grease, They'll uh, make a little more next year than they do this year, and they can kind of eventually move up the chain and get their own places. But in the meantime, you know, parents have to bring their kids um, to do laundry, and you know, these kids are in this adult world and being asked to do things. And you know, a lot of single moms are there. I grew up in a single parent household too, so I can. I can relate to that story. So yeah, I just, I love, I love the laundromat. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> it's owned by a Vietnamese couple. The majority of their clientele are either African American or Latino. Uh, I've learned by the way, having gone to China and Thailand that in Asian cultures, it's, it's, they have to say yes to everything. And so a guy wow. showing up with the camera, like they can't tell him to get out. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Hey, but they've pr- been pro a- tip for street photographers out there: <laughs> go into sure. a, a, a Chinese, a, a Vietnamese-owned businesses, and you'll be yep. you'll be sure to get some shots. Well done. Yeah, they'll they'll say yes. That's you can tangible. Stay. That's strategic, right there. For, for sure. So, but they're amazing, and like you know, it's it's re- they have repeat customers. So I, in having the ability to print my work, I uh, I print my photos, and I know when people are going to be there like if they go on Wednesdays or Thursdays and I'll try to bring them prints the next time I'm around um, or I will leave prints at the counter um, and so the people who own the shop um, will give the prints to other people you know my goal someday is to maybe have an exhibition at the laundromat uh, of the photos that I've made there with the proceeds, you know, going, I don't know, it'll be free, free night at the laundromat. So if it makes 500 bucks, you know, people can come in and yeah. they can do laundry up to 500 bucks and kind of give back to the community. Uh, it would be really fun to do that, you know? So you say exhibition, I'm immediately picturing a bunch of, a bunch of hipster kids and, and lime and boots and, and <laughs> mustaches and the big thick rim glasses drinking wine and beer. And they're like Hell looking no, at prints on the I, wall, <laughs> that's disrupting I, the piece. I want the people who have no idea what photography is, who were just coming to the laundromat on Wednesday night to do their laundry. That's who I want them to see the pictures. <laughs> in the meantime, they can uh, do their laundry too. You know, that's who I want to, to come cool. enjoy it. You know, because the photos is about them. It's not about anything else. Yeah. So well, and well, how how amazing would it be to have like these the, you know these nice 10, 15 foot prints on the, on the wall 
of, of people yeah. who come in there every day, right? That would be, <laughs> that would mo- be amazing. That would be the most legit laundromat ever. It would be super cool. <laughs> it would be super cool. I, yeah. Um, I, so I, I, I think it's interesting that the dynamic and the atmosphere of a laundromat is an interesting thing because I, my new apartment, luckily I do have a hookup for, um, for a washing machine and dryer. And in my video blogs, uh, where I also make videos, red blogs, um, I, I, on Thanksgiving, I sat on the, the, the dryer and I, in the video, I said, I, this is something I'm thankful for because in my last apartment, I had to go out in the cold, the rain, whatever, we had to take, you know, we had to put our stuff in, in the, in the, the hamper bin, take it over to the laundromat. Luckily it was in the apartment complex whenever those machines were working. Uh, but a laundromat is a place you just kind of don't want to be generally <laughs> like for sure. You, you, you feel like you're not productive. It's just, it's a place where you're like, I gotta, I gotta get these clothes washed. I it, I'm hungry right now. I don't want to deal with this. And it's, it's a state of limbo. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're suspended. And I think, you know, people who are trying to make their way in this country are kind of in that suspended state too, right? Cause they haven't quite made it yet. So mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think there's an analogy there. I totally agree. But it's also this great equalizer. Sorry, the cat is walking in front of the computer again. No, you're, you're, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great equalizer, element. right? Because everybody comes in with dirty clothes <laughs> and, and would rather be somewhere else. And like they can all relate to each other all of a sudden, you know, even if they're coming from very different places. Uh, well, again, I just, I, I love it, you know, it's great. Yeah, yeah. And then you have these kids that are, you know, <laughs> playing, making toys out of the, out of the baskets. And, yep. And yeah. uh, it's intriguing. I like, I, you know, and for whatever reason, I like focusing on kids, you know. By the way, I think women photographers, uh, well, first of all, they're much better than men. But they also have it a little easier, too, I think, in today's society. Because a guy shooting pictures of kids on the street or in, you know, establishments get different looks uh, than, you know, a woman does. So, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been kind of uh, challenging to navigate that situation. Especially but, for Jewish. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't for really sure. know what that means, but I'll just <laughs> carry on. I'm sure they're, uh, it's a knock against me in some way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's been fun. And, and you know, I, even on the streets, though, I like kids. And maybe it's just because I don't want to grow up. And, uh, there's an innocence, obviously to children and all those other cliches too. They're not, you know, burdened by the stresses of, of the real world yet. So, uh, I'm not sure exactly what that's about. Maybe I need to go sit on someone's couch to figure it out, but <laughs> I'll, I'll keep shooting those. They're fun. I, I mean, I think those are some of my better images. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so y- you have traveled a lot. I'm curious, uh, what, what have you learned? How is that different than Houston? How how has that uh, played out in your photography? Has it inspired you? And that's yeah, like questions. I think, it's I think it's making me a better photographer for Houston because when you're traveling and you're doing photography there, like you can get away with more because you're a tourist, you know. <laughs> you feel like you can, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to live with the consequences necessarily. Um, but you know, I was just in Mexico. I had to go shoot my wife's cousin's wedding. I'd never shot a wedding before. That was an interesting experience. I can talk about that in a second, but in Mexico, we were in, uh, what used to be called the Yucatan. Now it's called the Riviera Maya. Um, and we found our way into this industrial barrio in Playa del Carmen and in the midst of factories and other things that were going on there, there was a lot of residential, you know, pretty pretty squalid, poor living conditions. But kids were out in their yards and in the streets having the times of their lives. You know, I think it reminded me of Helen Levitt's work from New York in the tw- maybe 30s, I think, where kids used to actually go outside and play. Um, and it got me thinking about trying to make those photos you know, when I come back to Houston, because again, we have a large immigrant community in Houston. And so I imagine that that does exist uh, here. So I need to go find some of those neighborhoods where I can capture some of those scenes too, because I think those are the most marvelous things. You know, I think kids today are kind of robbed of, you know, childhood. I, it, I don't want to bleat too much on this opinion but you know kids who live their whole lives on iphones or ipads i think are kind of missing out you know Mm. uh, on some of the 
the valuable lessons I could be learning if they're interacting with other kids, you know, in the real world. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. Sure. Uh, Oh, and, you know. and even even them it be it being given to them as opposed to them having to to work for it. Yeah, and make mistakes in the process. You know, yeah. Yeah. make a mistake online. Eh, it's not that big of a deal. You make it in real life. You're gonna learn that lesson. You know. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's made me hungry uh, coming back to Houston to be able to do that. You know, to push my photography to the next step because you know when you live and work in the same place. You can get stuck in ruts, you know, um, and so I think it's given me some new ideas to come back and kind of uh, try something different. I, I I appreciate that a lot, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you have you ever heard of Simon Sinek? No, is that a he's a photographer? No, he's he's actually a uh, he. Well, he start he he's an entrepreneur, but his whole thing is uh, he he's really into this philosophical way of approaching marketing and life and so he he's he did a talk uh, a long time ago a TED talk called start with why and it's basically about people don't care as much about what you're selling as they care about why you're selling it and that's why for example Apple is such a successful co- company because they start with why they start they know their why and and that's how they market themselves so <clears throat> I watched a video of him recently he's just an incredibly um incredibly uh, intellectual brilliant mind and he I, I was listening to a conversation with him recently he was talking about how the the um, youth right now the the generation that's coming up are there horrible things are happening to them because of the devices and social media and uh, while I certainly believe that there are very very good things there, um, and, but there, there are a lot of kids that aren't taught to manage that properly yep. and it's very detrimental to them. I agree. And I think it affects relationships, you know, when kids aren't practiced at having a face to face conversation and building trust with somebody in physical space, they kind of miss out on yeah. all the benefits of that. Yeah. Not to say that you can't do that in a different way in an online community, with online communication, but it's different, you know? Mm. And those of us who know how great it is to do it in person kind of, I think, you know, want other people to be able to experience the joys of that too. So I'm on the same page. I'll have to check out that TED Talk. Thanks yeah, for no, uh, I'll, I'll definitely send it to you. The, 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 one that, uh, the one that I'm referring to is actually a more recent video. He was having a conversation with a guy, and he, he got incredibly passionate about this, and it was, mm. it was super thoughtful. I, I loved it. Uh, because Very I, cool. I, it's just in my close circles, I have, I have, uh, family members and people and I watch other kids who just, you know, they're at the, they're at the table at, they're out at a restaurant and it's like, kid starts crying, you pop an iPad in front of it. Yeah, it's watch, so watch true. Your, watch your little, uh, watch your little Lego building videos with no talking and just <laughs> shut up. You I'll know? go for, I'll go full circle here and say, you know, uh, in terms of photography, like smartphones are the absolute photo killer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I refuse to share photos with people on their phones. And I will throw out perfectly good photos if there's too much smartphoneage happening in a picture that I've made. Because it just, it's the bane of my existence, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is on that. So like you have to work really, really hard to capture good photos with people who are not on their phones, you know. So... Uh, it's so horrible. I, and I know some people have done clever shots of like family sitting around the dinner table all looking at their own devices, but that photo has been made now many times. So we got that. Yeah. <laughs> Throw something new, you know? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So, so what are, uh, very quickly, um, and then we can, we can wrap this thingy up and I'll let you get out of here and go eat dinner or play with your cats or whatever you want to do. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what, what are some goals you have for your photography in the future? What would you like to do? And I, I'm talking far out over over a lifetime. What would you hope uh, to achieve? Wow. <laughs> you know, I guess it's – I'm a kind of a fundamentals guy. This you is know? where you start crying, by the way, as you talk. Oh, for sure, for sure, and start hating my work even more than I do. Um, <laughs> you know, I had the opportunity to shoot a wedding recently uh, in Mexico, and I was – terrified because I'm not a wedding photographer and if my wife's cousin was expecting a wedding photographer's photos 
like, you know, he wasn't going to get that. I wasn't going to pretend to be. So I shot it like a street photographer. Um, Thank you for circling back to that, by the way. I meant to ask you. Oh, yeah. No worries. (laughs) So I kind of shot it from that perspective. And there's actually a, a really great photographer in the UK named Kevin Mullins, also a Fuji guy who has kind of really uh, made a name for himself from that perspective. Um, so I guess one goal is to be able to shoot other genre in photography, uh, but in my own way. Like, mm. I want people to look at my image and even if it's you know a wedding or if it's a guy coming out of jail in Houston or a kid sitting in a basket in a laundromat or you know somebody at Yellowstone National Park or wherever, I want people to look at my images and say, hey, I recognize that as a Michael Duke image. Like, you know, I want my voice to be to be heard. So I would like to be able to shoot, learn to shoot other genre, but still kind of make it my own. That would be definitely a huge, a huge goal. Um, but also just kind of going back to the fundamentals. One thing that Lynn Lane taught me was to focus on three things, uh, composition, uh, subject to environment relationship and story. And I think just be able to have all three of those elements come together in every single image I make, like that's my goal. That's what my goal was two years ago when I started this journey. That's what I want my goal to be in 20 years for me to still make photos that accomplish that, you know? So that sounds a lot like something you could learn on my channel. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and I, one of the things that has actually helped me grow tremendously is our relationship. It's my channel. Thank you so much. No. Oh, I'm sorry. For your relationship. <laughs> no, my relationship with you. Honest <laughs> to God. You put, out, you put out phenomenal work both on your YouTube channel but also in your social media platforms, both on Tumblr and, you know, and Instagram. Uh, you're a great teacher, man, and I really appreciate everything that you do for, for me personally but also for anybody who – has you know the desire to go out and make photos not for any other reason in the world but just because something inside of us tells us to go out there at 5 30 in the morning (laughs) and go make photos you know well i appreciate that but you didn't have to lie um so (laughs) no that's that's that means a lot man thank you so much uh so what the the last thing i the last question i wanted to ask you was what would you say to somebody who wants to start pursuing photography seriously? Because going back to that to the 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 laundromat limbo thing, um, oh, that was so sweet. He just blew a kiss. I, my, wife. My, my wife just walked in. Yeah. Hi, wife. <laughs> James says hello. Hi. We'll talk to you about photography too, if you want. Oh yeah, she, I said she's my editor. She's my muse. She's my everything. So. Yeah. And my curator, she just says yes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that, that would be a good song. Those are good song lyrics. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Write that down. Uh, where was that? You, uh, if so, oh, yeah, somebody. Oh, so there are a lot of people who are in photography. They are in this. You, you referred to a laundromat as a limbo. <laughs> They're in <laughs> the laundromat of photography. <laughs> and they are they go out every now and then. They're like, oh, that's a pretty tree, and I'll take a photo of it. But they're not. they're not – diving in they're not pursuing it they're not getting scared and challenging themselves and pushing themselves what would you say to somebody like that and what would be some steps that they could take so let's see uh i guess step one is to have intent uh meaning don't take a photo go make a photo um you know snapshots are snapshots but you really have to have a reason for being there with your camera drawing it up to your eye or your hip and pushing that button. Like there's a reason why you're doing that. So let us understand the reason why you're doing it by viewing your picture. I say that's number one. So start um, with why. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess another, another step is, and maybe this is applicable to anything that you do in life. And that is to, to take the work that you do seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Because you have to have fun with this. Um, the minute you get like really serious about it, I think you can get stuck really easily because you get entrenched and then you become myopic and you don't open yourself up to different directions and new ideas. Um, if you're just out there having a hell of a good time with it, then you're open to those other possibilities. So I think that's really, really important. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and if you're hating it, that's a signal to go try something different, you know? And, and it, um, to jump in, I, I think that enjoying yourself is also a, a very magical way to open yourself up to serendipity. And, you, and you, you see things you don't normally see when you're in that state. Because it's totally. all about the state you're in when you're doing anything in life. And when you're, when you're out uh, taking photos, when you're doing anything else, you could either be in this place of, of this isn't working or, or t- you know, taking the technicals too seriously. Did I get my settings right? Or you could be in a place where you're kind of flowing and living. It's, it's, it's a flow state type of thing that you want to achieve. I totally agree. And, you know, if you get, if, if identify roadblocks, you know, like if you are hung up on getting a good exposure, there's no shame in go shooting in a semi automatic or fully automatic mode. Like eliminate that variable so that you can go focus on the things that you really need to focus on. You can come back to that later on after you've worked out those other problems. Um, but, you know, make it as easy on yourself as possible. And I'll go back to the gear thing again. Like, the Fuji cameras make it easy for me. That camera gets out of my way. Uh, I can carry that thing for 12 hours and have no back aches. Um, it was not that way when I was shooting a full frame professional Nikon setup, you know. Um, and so, uh, and that goes back to my earlier point too, I guess, about just having a good fit with the gear that you choose to invest in. So um, it's got to be fun. It's got to be an enjoyable experience. Otherwise, why the hell are you doing it? Life is short, you know. Like, go do something you enjoy. Uh, and if it's, it's okay that there can be painful moments, but you know, the ends have to justify the means and the ends need to be that you feel good about what you're doing and growing as a person and as a photographer. So fantastic thoughts. <laughs> I like it. Awesome, man. Well, I know I told you that this was going to be a 30 minute conversation, but this is what we're coming up on. I think about seven hours now. So uh, I'm sure I bored you to death and everybody oh, else. Too. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh no, this has been wonderful. Uh, I, I will link below to everybody watching to the gear that he uses so that you can also, because you made a perfectly good case for a Fuji camera. And uh, I'll take my royalty checks. So uh, yes, okay, yeah, got it. Um, I'll send you. I'll send you uh, some buffalo nickels and then the mail. <laughs> Those I think actually is, is legal currency here in Texas. So oh good, yeah. That, well, but, especially in Texas, I'm sure they. Uh, yep. Oh, you know, I'll throw in one more thing that's really helped me too. If somebody else is like looking to kind of help themselves out and that is to pick one social media platform and like, you know, get out there and show your work, open yourself up to critique. Um, I've done that through Tumblr. I've begrudgingly recently joined Instagram, which I hate and I suck at it. So I may give that up soon. Uh, Tumblr has worked for me and it's helped me build community um, with other photographers who sometimes are your cheerleaders and other times give you really, you know, hard advice, but it ends up being a good thing too. So, uh, just horribly mean people like me. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a terrible guy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just kidding. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. Uh, and that's how I met James actually. He sent me a message out of the blue one day. So I would definitely. Yeah. Cause Tumblr's blue. Well done. Uh Nice. (laughs) Dark blue. Okay. This is going downhill. (laughs) <laughs> I will shut up now. Awesome. No, I, I really appreciate you uh, you having a conversation with me, man. I think this is some super valuable stuff for people, and I, I think that that there there's not enough talk about um, the 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 very dynamic and uh, philosophical art that is photography and street photography. There's a lot of gear videos out there. There's there you know. Um, luckily, we have people pulling up the reins with um, Ted Forbes. He, he's, he's amazing. A fellow Texan. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's in Dallas, Fort Worth. Awesome. Was so. he, he, uh, he used to be in Houston, though, right? Uh, that's possible. It was funny, actually. I was watching him in bed one night, and my wife As one recognized does. his name or his sound of his voice because his wife apparently worked in the same museum where Rachel worked up in Dallas. So it's kind of a small world. Oh, uh, neat. Yeah, he's, or, he 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 seems like a he seems like a, a fine guy. Yeah, he's awesome. His product is amazing. Not as good as this guy named James Red, um, but maybe Ted <laughs> will someday rise to that level. But uh, yeah, yeah Ted that's why I brought stuff. you on here. <laughs> There's another really cool YouTube video. Those of you who like film photography, by the way, and that's something that I've learned 
to to teach i've taught myself some film photography in the last couple of months and that's helped my digital work as well just because it's so so much more thoughtful but um there's this cute kid in the uk i don't even know what his name is but his youtube channel is called negative feedback mm. and it's all about film photography uh and it's really it's they're well polished videos i like them a lot so cool cool all right yep, yep. very good well i'll link below to those things cool um, Michael, this has been a wonderful conversation. And for everyone that is watching, I hope you have a lovely day. Give Michael some love and goodbye. Thank you very much.